Good afternoon, guys. How are you doing? Doing all right? Um, how many of you guys uh, went yesterday to the lecture? I saw, I saw many of you there. So I, I hope you, you couldn't make it? No, I, I didn't want to do it. OK. Um, so it, 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 was, it was a very good lecture. And I wanted to, to emphasize a, a few things that, that Scott Sheffield said. And uh, at the same time, you know, I hope that all of, all of the people that went were a lot more motivated to study and to understand hydraulic fracturing because it's really uh, changing uh, how oil industry is going to work in the future. So uh, a few things I want to say. Um, that he said, for those of you that weren't there, about 4.2 millions of barrels of oil per day are producing the Perman, Permian right now from unconventionals. And that number, which is about a third of what the U.S. produces right now, is expected to grow three times in the future, expected to go at 12. So uh, that means that there is going to be a lot more of opportunities in the Permian in the future. And what he said too is that very likely the companies that are going to invest very heavily in the Permian in the future are Chevron and Exxon in addition to, to all independents. Something else that he said very interesting, 25% of the rigs in the world are now in the Permian. 25%, right? In such a small place, uh, well, it's not, it's not small, but you know, compared to all the world, having 25% of the rigs in the Permian, it's, it's a lot. And that accounts also for about 55% of the rigs in the US. So more than half of the rigs in the US, they are all in the Permian. Uh, the Permian alone produces two-thirds of the unconventionals in the U.S. So, you know, we know that the Barnett is big. We know that uh, Bakken also is very important. Uh, in Niobrara in Colorado is very important too, but, but the Permian is two-thirds of that, the Permian alone. Um, what else? Um, well, that's mostly all the facts I wanted to say. But I wanted to, to emphasize that the hydraulic fracture is becoming very important, and also the Permian is the center of the action. I know that some of you never went to the Permian. I actually uh, talked uh, before with Scott Sheffield. He said he was interested in uh, inviting students to go over there to visit some of the fracturing places. and. Uh, I don't know if that's going to happen for this semester because it's kind of late, but probably will happen in the next semester. And if you haven't gone to uh, to Midland and you you know hesitate about taking a job over there, uh, you should really think it twice. Okay, I know it's a kind of a a place which is far away, not very well connected to major cities. But at the same time, as I told you before, it's the center of the action for petroleum industry. Uh, I was talking once with Professor Sharma, and he was <coughs> saying that the Midland is to petroleum industry, what Silicon Valley is to the semiconductor and information technology industry. So it's the center. If you go there, you will meet, as Ryan Sheffield said, you will meet very interesting people, you will surround yourself with very motivated people that are probably are gonna help you a lot uh, in the future uh, if you uh, continue on this path on the petroleum industry. So uh, it's a very exciting time and uh, it's gonna continue growing. So you're gonna see a lot more about hydraulic fractures uh, in the future in your time. Okay, so that, that was just an introduction and uh, let's try to review what we have seen so far. Uh, the first thing that we saw was the hydraulic fractures also happen in nature 
I know happen because uh, fluids like magma or sometimes like uh, unconstructed sediments can get pressurized and if the pressure overcomes the minimum principal stress S3 they will open up uh, a fracture and will go up into the surface that's what is called dikes we also saw that hydraulic fractures are very important in well testing the first example is the leak of test that tells you how much high in pressure you can go uh, without getting a large fracture in the wellbore but sometimes in order to know how to get there you have to make the fracture and that's the purpose <coughs> of the leak of test then we talked about the defeat test and the defeat test uh, it's it very similar to the leak of test but it's done for completion and it's done with hydraulic fracturing and usually through perforations in which you were you are supposed to do a hydraulic fracture uh, completion but the analysis is very similar in fact in the homework you're going to have to use data from a mini frag test let me uh, i have updated the, the website so now you can see the problems and for not this friday by the following friday uh, you have to solve a leak of test problem problem one a mini frag uh, test problem which is problem number two and uh, well, two of those and a step rate problem um, so you're gonna you're gonna have to do that and you're gonna have to use the analysis that we said help us identify the fracture closure pressure based on the flow regime when it changes from being uh, proportional to the square root of time when it gets slower at that point that's a fracture closure pressure so uh, today we're going to talk about the step rate test and the step rate test is a test that also involves a hydraulic fracture and the objective is to find what is the maximum injection pressure and also what is the maximum injection rate in some applications like water disposal uh, you are being paid by how much fluid uh, you can dispose so the rate is very important uh, you want to do that as quickly as possible without compromising the uh, geomechanics in that particular reservoir but uh, disposal water is just uh, one example uh, before we move on, where, where does the disposal water come from? The produced water. Produced water, it comes from? It, it can come from just regular production. Uh, you know that sometimes there are some fields that produce a lot of water, and sometimes they're even economical, producing like 90% water, if they produce 10% oil, sometimes that's okay. So uh, it comes from production, it comes from EOR. If you do water flooding and you recover water, you also gonna have uh, water to dispose. And it also comes from <coughs> fracturing. <coughs> Some of the water uh, that, um, that you inject, uh, you recover it after fracturing and uh, also you have to dispose, dispose it safely. Coming back to Scott Sheffield's uh, lecture, he was saying that they are moving to, in a few years, to work with 100% recycled water. So they don't have to utilize new sources of water, but they just use uh, whatever they use for fracturing, they recover a percentage of that and they reuse it again so they don't have to dispose it. He was pointing out to something that we talked a little bit before, but not much, which is about injection of water into other formations. And he was saying that there is a St. Andrews formation that it's already quite a bit pressurized, so they need to find another solution. 
what happens when you inject the pore pressure too much in a given formation? You may you lower the effective stress and you may cause full reactivation, and that's what uh, was causing a lot of induced seismicity in Oklahoma. We're going to talk about micro seismicity later on. Uh, and you will see how nicely applies all the learning that we did about shear uh, fracturing is going to come back when we talk about micro seismicity. Okay, so disposal water, but also, you know, sometimes uh, you may uh, inject uh, just water for EOR. I know I'm kind of repeating what I said before, but I just want to make it just one point. Uh, but sometimes also you can inject gases like CO2, uh, like nitrogen. And uh, uh, for example, now I'm starting a project to understand better uh, what are the injection rates for polymer. Polymer is very complex, the rheology. It, uh, it goes from shear thinning to shear thickening, so it, it makes fracturing very, very complicated. But for all of those cases, I'm missing one. You can also <coughs> inject steam. For all of those cases, what we want to do is uh, to understand what is the maximum injection pressure and what is the maximum injection rate <coughs> at which you can uh, dispose safely uh, some of these fluids. And usually, uh, we are injecting these fluids into a more or less permeable formation. We're not doing this uh, into a tight formation because the, the whole objective is just to inject those fluids uh, in uh, high permeability rocks. So these rates are relatively high. And one more thing uh, about this is that there are some cases in which this step rate test is a requirement. And there are some re regulatory agencies that required to do a step rate test to set what is the maximum pressure of injection before you inject uh, anything. So uh, sometimes it's not an option. It's not like the leak of test sometimes may be an option. Uh, but uh, step rate test sometimes it's a requirement. All right, so let's see what is the step rate test about. Uh, in the step rate test, what you're going to do is, as the name says, you're going to increase the rates as a function of time in steps. Uh, before, you, you have to see more or less what is going to be uh, the maximum injection rate. You have to do an estimation of that. And after that, you in just increase the step rate test, and usually it is recommended that you do this in six, seven steps. And while you do that, you will observe that what's going to happen uh, with the pressure in the wellbore. Same case as before, we're injecting into a formation, we're isolating a wellbore, and we're just injecting into the formation. So probably you can also do this through perforations. And you're just injecting here. So what, what do you think is going to if you increase injection rate, what's going to happen with the pressure? And how fast is it going to increase? <coughs> it will depend on the permeability of the formation, but usually it will show uh, a behavior that at the beginning this is uh, the initial pressure when you start injecting. It's going to increase and then it's going to plateau when you get to more or less steady state. Uh, 
then if you increase it again it's going to do the same uh, it's going to increase in the same manner uh, while you're doing this your wellbore and just to make it easier let's imagine that this is an uncased wellbore your fluid is going to uh, permeate through the walls of the wellbore but at some point uh, what you may see in this problem let's do one more step to make it uh, easier to see so let's see I have this is one more the increase is more or less <coughs> the same after some point uh, you are going to fracture the wellbore because the pressure is going to be too high what do you think is going to happen at that point will the pressure increase the same as in all the other steps or will it increase more or less I refer to this increment each time you increase the, the rate less will it increase less or more less why, why less the volume more, uh, more than volume there is another thing that it's increasing to what well if you get to fracture the, the wellbore now you're going to have additional area and if you have additional area for for fluid you're going to require less pressure to inject the same amount and when that happens uh, your increments of pressure are not going to be as high as before and as a result you're going to see something like this in which the increments now are much smaller than what they were before and you can now use this data to plot independent <coughs> of time you can plot injection rate and pressure and you will see that as you increase the injection rate uh, your pressure final pressure at more or less steady state conditions uh, at this point are going to be are going to line up corresponding to the injectivity of the wellbore without the fracture and after you surpass the limit of the pressure and the rates with the fracture you will have another line with a new injectivity you trace a line to find uh, those two uh, to join those two sets of uh, points let me, let me do it different, differently so the triangles are after uh, fracturing and from here you will get your injection uh, rate uh, for fracturing and here from that point you're gonna get what is called the formation parting pressure and this one is going to be the formation parting rate so let me just write it and this one is for pressure and it is as as simple as that uh, just increase the rate you see the point at which the regime changes and that point is going to be the maximum uh, pressure at which you can inject safely without uh, fracturing the injector do you think that pressure is going to be higher lower or the same as the minimum principal stress s3 
higher, why higher? <laughs> <laughs> but why? Okay, and you have something else? Yeah. But basically, uh, you need additional pressure to keep the fracture open <coughs> and also to overcome viscous forces. Uh, so far, I'm not telling you anything about how to solve that problem because we, we haven't seen it yet, but that's what is coming right after this. How to predict how much additional pressure uh, we need in order uh, to <coughs> propagate the fracture. So this formation part in pressure is going to be higher than the minimum principal stress. Um, all right. So I think that's uh, mostly everything I wanted to say about the uh, step rate test. It's very easy in the homework. Oh, on Friday, we're going to solve a problem about it as well. Yes? If you keep increasing the rate, like after the fracture happens, does it hit a plateau or is it just steady? So that increases okay, that's a great point that I almost forgot about that. Uh, this analysis of the stable rate test, uh, that's an assumption which is very important. And it assumes an infinitely large uh, reservoir so that means that uh, if it's infinitely large the pressure is going to be is going to always increase as uh, you increase the injection rate because far away there is going to be a boundary that where the pressure is always the far field pressure however there is a problem here and that's also a problem that the people from Oklahoma have is that probably they did an injection uh, injecting say a, a thousand barrels and they found in a, a formation parting rate they injected below that but they didn't take into account that into a finite volume over time as you keep keep on injecting the pressure the pore pressure is going to start to increase everywhere in the formation and that's a point in which you start to have uh, full reactivation and there is no uh, test or regulation about that so far but uh, now for example what uh, some uh, states are asking the operators to do is to in addition when they do this type of disposal is also to add micro seismic monitoring so they, they make sure that they do not fracture the well and also they do not cause a full reactivation uh, you got something to say? So when, when you say the, the reservoir is engine, is that finite or infinite? What's the assumption? Uh, infinitely large. That it's a... So it's finite, for example, if you have like second stage fracturing or you have fracturing or hydraulic fracturing. Yeah. Does that change how this test works? Th that would change because it would change the initial pore pressure as well. And if it, your wells are too close, the fractures also may interact with each other. That's something we're going to see later for for hydraulic fracturing. The fractures can interact with each other okay. with this, in terms of stresses and pressure. Okay, uh, so as I was saying, there is a problem about this one in the homework. Uh, we'll, we'll come back to this. It's not, it's not too difficult. Uh, One, one more thing I'd like to say about this. Uh, if, if you're doing EOR, do you think uh, fracturing the injector is good or bad? Why? Why? Okay, but I'm... I think you are doing an assumption there. What about, let's say that the leak off is high. you will be, you will increase your injectivity. Yeah. So, 
let's say that we have an injector here and a producer over here and we are in normal faulting and your minimum principal stress direction is perpendicular to the line that links the projector the producer and the injector that's going to be that's going to be bad why everyone sees that so what's going to happen is that if you eventually fracture the injector your hydraulic fracture is going to hit directly the producer and if you do that uh, e all what you injected water polymers surfactants anything is going to go directly into the producer and uh, it's going to hit the producer very quickly and uh, and of course that's that's not going to be good because your sweep efficiency is going to be very low all the oil that was sitting there 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 is not going to be pushed by the injector uh, to the producer however if you were smart enough to figure out what sometimes it's not an issue about being smart it's just about having the right data and knowing a bit about uh, geomechanics if you knew that this is your condition and if you wanted to uh, use a fracture in your advantage probably you may want to use a, put the injector here and the producer here because in that way you would cause a fracture to grow in this direction and you may even also fracture the producer and then whatever you inject is going to have a much uh, homogeneous uh, displacement front than what you had before so before you just break through directly into the producer but now uh, you will be able to increase a lot more the sweep efficiency by taking advantage of of the fractures so it can be good or it can be bad it depends on the orientation of the stresses and the configuration of the wellbores and that's that is why it's so important to know the state of the stresses when there are hydraulic fractures we saw that for multi-stage hydraulic fracturing you always want to drill your wellbore your horizontal wellbore in the direction of the minimum principal stress but in other applications you're going to to see very similar uh, uh, phenomena okay uh, let's talk now about uh, understanding how a hydraulic fracture forms and how we can predict the pressure as it propagates and this is let me tell you it's not an easy problem and it involves many things that you have learned so far and almost all the things we have seen in geomechanics so far uh, so in order to get here uh, there, there is a lot of content that uh, you have to know and I'm, I'm sure you do but you now you're going to see that it becomes uh, very useful and uh, we're going to call this the coupled hydraulic fracture propagation problem and it's called coupled uh, because uh, you're going to see that we're going to have to to link uh, a fluid flow in the fracture with fluid flow in the formation with opening of the fracture and uh, rock failure so all of them are going to be uh, together all right so let me start by making a schematic of a wellbore and a fracture which is propagating and it has more or less uh, that shape uh, I'm going to uh, so this that's a wellbore and the fracture is opening 
rock that we're going to consider it's an elastic medium. The first thing that we have to solve and we have to understand is what is the width of the fracture at the given location where this is going to be x and this is going to be y so what is the width as a function of x what do you think that width is going to depend on uh, say again Yeah, yeah, we, we're going to get to that in a bit, but before we do that, we, we need to understand this very well. Um, but um, what, what I'm asking you here is um, what is going to make the, the width of the fracture larger? What properties of the formation or what properties of what actions that you are doing when you're injecting? Yes. Pressure, okay, I, I, I like more, Let, let's talk about, first about pressure, and I'll come back to the properties of, of the, the higher the pressure, the bigger is going to be the width of the fracture, right? And why? Because this solid is an elastic medium, we're going to assume it as, as elastic, and it has a given elastic modulus and Poisson ratio, and you could even imagine this like elastic spring, right? The smaller the modulus, the easier it get with, this, with the same pressure to open a fracture. The higher the pressure, also the bigger the width of the fracture uh, is going to be. So if you want to solve exactly what is that width as a function of distance as a function of pressure and as a function of the properties of the medium what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to solve the equations that we saw uh, in the first part of the semester in which we said that uh, if you remember that strains were proportional to the stresses applied and to the stiffness of the medium and then if you put this together with uh, something that we call the kinematic uh, equations these are the constitutive equations and the equilibrium equations you get to the Navier's equation that had those inverted triangles that mean derivatives and that allow you to solve any problem well um, we're not going to solve that problem, but we're going to show the solution similar to what we did for the wellbore. And we talked about the Kier solution. There is also a simple solution for a fracture that we're going to see later on. But in summary, uh, you, you can solve this. It's not too difficult, okay? You can solve this if the problem is simple analytically or you can solve it numerically. It's not too difficult. But in summary, the width, as we said before, uh, is going to be proportional to pressure and inversionally proportional to the Young modules. In this problem of a propagating fracture, we're going to have fluid that flows through the fracture, okay? And that fluid if it's flowing, that means that there is a pressure gradient. And if there is a pressure gradient, that means that the pressure here is not the same as the pressure there. Uh, so that uh, we, we cannot assume a constant pressure in this fracture for the moment because it is, it is propagating. So let's go to this part then. Um, if we want to solve what is the rate of fluid injection within the fracture, going through the fracture, 
uh, we're going to have to solve a fluid mechanics problem. And what what's, what does this look like? I'm assuming, I didn't say that, I'm assuming a more or less a 2D uh, geometry in which this is an infinitely long fracture in this direction. Okay? So what does that look to you? How, can, how could we predict what is that flow rate? It's going to depend on what? No, you, we cannot use Darcy because Darcy is for porous media. This is not a porous medium. Uh, this is an uh, empty medium. Okay, so you assume incompressible fluid flow. Uh, we let's say we assume laminar fluid flow, and the width of the fracture. And if you remember. There is a solution for this, which is a solution of fluid flow between two parallel plates that you that you learned in fluid mechanics. That depends on viscosity as well, and tells you that this rate is going to be proportional to the width of the fracture to the power of three times the height of the fracture. I'm going to tell you in a bit what the height of the fracture is inversely proportional to viscosity the more viscous the fluid the higher the pressure gradients you need to move that and proportional to the pressure gradient along the direction x so uh, what is hf uh, let me do a schematic of this uh, we're assuming that if this is this is the fracture formation this is a well bore I'm assuming that the fracture is contained in between these two formations we're talking about why the fracture may be contained sometimes let's say that those are stiff shales and this is sandstone so hf is going to be the height of the fracture and xf is going to be the half length of the fracture okay but you can also do this you can also solve this problem notice that now uh, because the width varies with distance uh, the gradient of pressure also is not going to be linear it's going to change the closer you get to the tip the more steeply the uh, pressure is going to change so this is laminar flow and Newtonian fluid okay so, so far we have tackled uh, two problems that allows us to solve and to understand a hydraulic fracture propagation problem. We have two more to solve. Let us say now that this is a permeable medium. What's going to happen with the fluid that goes through the fracture? is going to leak right and uh, that is called a leak off in order to account for that uh, what we do is we separate those two volumes there's going to be the total injected volume some of it is a volume that goes into the fracture and some of that is a volume that leaks so this is the total this is the, the one that goes into the fracture and this is the one that leaks how do you calculate the total injected volume 
That one is very easy because you know that. It's just injection rate times time. If we assume constant injection rate, it's just injection rate uh, times uh, time. Something to take into account into these equations and into these derivations. I here just refers to one wing, okay? So if you are given the total injection rate in the wellbore, in order to use these equations later on, you have to divide that by two because this parameter I injection rate just going to be for one wing. So we know this one. And uh, what about the leak of volume? Can we calculate that? There are two solutions for to calculate the leak of volume. One is that you do, as you do in reservoir simulation, you just solve the problem of fluid flow in a porous medium, and that will allow you to uh, calculate very precisely what is that leak of volume. But also you can use some other equations that simplify that and allow you to calculate the leak of volume. And that's going to be proportional to the area of leak of AL times two times, because we, you have two surfaces in one wing, the Carter leak of factor times square root of T, square root of T shows up again over here. Uh, because it's considered there is a uh, leak off from a planar surface plus some amount which is called the spurt loss. So that's the Im Im immediate fluid that, that you lose right after you inject. And after that, that depends on time. And the Carter leak off coefficient depends on the properties of the formation, how permeable it is and also on the properties of the formation uh, of the fracturing fluid. Um, let me see if I forget anything. Okay, so uh, if, you if you know the total, and uh, you know how much it goes into the, into the medium through leak off, what you can calculate is what is called an efficiency factor, which is the ratio of what it goes into the fracture divided the total injected volume. So a very low efficiency number that means that all your fluid is not going into the fracture to open the fracture but it's going into the formation and a low a high efficiency number that means that you're using most of your fluid uh, to open the fracture. You have a question? I, I have a question about the, uh, the area. The yes. We go, we're going to get into that calculation uh, after we talk about this. So, so far we're not doing an assumption, but we're going to do it after this because you, you have several types of geometries. Uh, so the uh, area of the leak doesn't have anything to do with the fracture of area, right? It's the area of the leak off is going to be more or less XF times H, HF. Mm -hmm. You can get a little bit more refined by with that, but it's just going to be that. Yeah, so Mr. Herrera. In Well, that's something very interesting because many people expected that if when you were to fracture unconventionals, you will have very high efficiency values, but actually a lot of the water is lost into the formation. You cannot explain that by just considering what is the permeability of the shale but what appears to happen in unconventionals is that you have other networks of uh, natural fractures that take a lot of that water through leak off. So it's not as high as, as you may, may think. Not, it's not 100%. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Will, you had a question before? Yes, you, you have that. that. Two, 
Yes, okay. correct. Okay. Yeah, the, usually you know this because you know your your pump injection rate, so you have a data function of time. So, yeah, so we're saying here that most of the parameters has dependent on the properties of the work. So how do you boost the efficiency here? Here? Yeah, well, it would depend on what kind of uh, fluids you're using. You can make the fluids a little bit more viscous to not to get into into the formation uh, that quickly. That will change that. Correct. That will change the, the Carter leak off coefficient. So this one is the Carter leak off coefficient. Okay, so we have the problem almost solved. What else is, do you think we are missing here in this coupled problem of hydraulic fracture propagation? Uh, you, you could think this in terms of energy, right? On the surface, you have very powerful pumps. Some of them are like uh, 1,000 horse power and you have 20 of those. So you have 20,000 horsepower of power in uh, to make some of these fractures. Uh, well, the, the, length, the length is more or less captured with this X because we know that, that this one is gonna vary with length, this one is going to vary with length, and this one is gonna vary with length too because now we have leak off. <coughs> so not everything is getting <coughs> into the tip. Uh, and you could think like this, all of this power of this energy, it goes into opening a fracture that takes energy, right? Force times displacement, that's energy. There is energy needed to open the fracture. There is energy needed to move the fluid through the fracture. Sometimes these fractures can be hundreds of feet long, 100 feet long, 100 feet long, and just less than an inch in aperture. So that's gonna require a lot of uh, pressure in order to make it flow through that. So that's going to go into viscous losses, all that energy, and as it goes into the formation, also it's going to go into viscous losses, but now flowing into the formation. What else are we missing? Where where does energy also go into the process of fracturing? Breaking the rock, right? So fracturing the rock. That's the last thing that we're missing. So in order for the fracture to propagate, we need to split the rock. You have to open the rock in, uh, in two. And we are going to solve this problem by, uh, this is going to be number four. This is basically the creation of new surface. And we're going to solve this problem by uh, using the theory of fracture mechanics. We're going to see right after this that the equations of linear elasticity tell us that if we have a fracture, the tensile stress at the tip are approach infinity. So is infinity larger than tensile strength? Yes. Obviously yes, right? So we, we cannot use a tensile strength criterion for fractures. We need something else. And that's something else that we're going to use is called uh, fracture toughness and also fracture intensity. So we're going to say that a fracture propagates whenever the stress intensity is larger than the fracture toughness. And we'll see on Friday what are these two about. Yes.
What? Can you measure KI? KI? Yes, and actually we're going to do it in class. We're going to measure fracture toughness in class. And we're also going to do, uh, all of you are going to do two experiments of fracture toughness with your own sample. You, you will see that's going to be a lot of fun on Friday. So please stop by. All right, guys. See you.